Uh, surgeons, we have an interest in radiology for several reasons. Even if we can diagnose most of our patients by a clinical examination, we still want a radiological confirmation to be certain of exactly what we are treating. In addition, the radiology gives us information of what we suspect or even have no clue of. That is the, the associated malformations we may detect in our patients. Of course, uh, more in the syndromic cases. We can plan our surgery more accurately and evaluate what we did accomplish as follow-up. Finally, most of our research is based on radiologic examinations for our measurements. The first scientific report uh, of craniosynostosis from my hospital was published in 1968 discussing intracranial hypertension and appearance as indications for surgery. The same things we still debate. They had, however, only radiographs for the skull and pneumoencephalography for the visualization of the intracranial space where air was injected into the cerebrospinal space, which was a difficult, painful, and even dangerous method. For many years, cephalometry was our workhorse to diagnose and follow up craniosynostosis. <clears throat> it had, however, several drawbacks. It was often hard to see the synostotic suture so we had to rely on uh, secondary ch changes of shape. It was not possible to accurately make a diagnosis of a combined synostosis or, for example, a frontal sphenoid synostosis. The majority of our cases will be sagittal and metopic craniosynostosis, but for all synostosis cases and syndromes, the 3D CT is our main diagnostic tool. Sagittal synostosis, the most common form, may as you know come with the different shapes of the long and narrow skull and the CT will help us in the evaluation of how to best uh, do the surgery for each individual. Sometimes we see, for example, asymmetries partial synostosis, and bone defects, as in the left picture. All details we have to address in surgery, whether we use strip craniectomies, springs, or cranioplasty. In the metopic synostosis, we see the triangular pointed forehead, the small anterior volume of the skull, and the hypothalamus. There is a debate today regarding which patients to operate and which to leave unoperated because it has a tendency to be a little better over time in some cases. Uh, the two pictures on the right show a three month and three weeks of the CT. So we want our patients early, but maybe not too early. We rarely recommend uh, a CT to be taken before two months of age because uh, when we see them, like in the middle of the picture, it's more easily for us to plan our surgery well. And uh, maybe a younger child will suffer more from the radiation than uh, later on. Surgically, all the deformities has to be taken into consideration, and we always try to improve our results. And here we need, of course, multi-center studies to show what is the most efficient surgical method, but we also know how to best use the CT scan to compare the results. The unicoronal synostosis gives a more complex deformity with secondary impact on facial structures. For an unexperienced healthcare staff, it may be hard to detect and differ from torticollis or a positional deformity. We presently use uh, destruction osteogenesis as our surgical technique. 
we do not want positional deformities to have CT scans. So, in lambda synostosis, we still diagnose clinically and only the ones that we really believe have a true synostosis will have an X-ray. Frontosinoid synostosis is also difficult to diagnose clinically uh, to differ from unicoronal or a combination of unicoronal and frontosinoid. But the nice resolution we have in the CT gives us a rather detailed information of the small sutures involved in this diagnosis. The bicoronal synostosis may also have details that will require individually designed surgery, whether it will be a one-stage or a two-stage procedure. CT examination will reveal more complex craniosynostosis, like this bicoronal and unilambdoid synostosis, which are hard to diagnose clinically or by skull radiographs. We also see things that we do not look for, like in this three-year-old boy with Sutter-Schotzen syndrome, where the, the sagittal and both lambdoid sutures are closed and disappeared. This patient had no surgery and has no sign of uh, any deformities and even not any sign of elevated intracranial pressure. We can see aberrant sutures, we can see wormion bones and ossification of the frontal and other things in the CT, and we learn from them. CT and MRI imaging is the cornerstone of diagnostics in our craniofacial syndromes. I will not talk about the MRI because they will, my colleagues will do that later. Even if we can establish a clinical and genetic diagnosis of the syndrome, any suture might be involved. And there is a risk of intracranial hypertension, hydrocephalus, carry malformation, and a lack of bone making the surgery difficult. We rely on our CT and MRI investigations to diagnose, find additional malformations, and do our follow-ups and research. We are very dependent on radiology for our research. Whether it is simple measurements or more complex area, volume or shape calculations. Previously it was very time consuming to do these measurements manually or semi-manually, but as time passes more of these are available from the radiology department. So in summary, what radiologic examinations do we do in Sweden? We have long geographic distances, uh, which means that the most common consultation will be on email, where other colleagues can send photographs of skull deformity patients. In this way, we can rule out most of them that will never have an X-ray examination. Some patients we see physically in our clinic and decide whether they have a surgery requiring synostosis or not. All synostosis patients will go through a low-dose CT scan preoperatively, sometimes postoperatively, if we take out springs or distraction devices, and a three years follow-up. That means that our current synostosis patients will have two or three low-dose CT scan in total. The syndromic patients will have the same but additional MRIs or CT scans as individually indicated. Some words about radiology in cleft lip and palate patients. Our cleft lip and palate care includes, as you recognize, of course, the intraoral occlusal film radiographs for pre-op and post-op evaluation of alveolar bone grafting. The orthopentomogram or a panoramic radiograph can reveal missing or supernumerary teeth, displaced teeth, and 
a symmetric eruption pattern. It is also useful for bone graft follow-up. A video fluoroscopic X-ray of the palate is often performed as part of the velopharyngeal dysfunction investigation. Such an X-ray examination provides answers to questions about the length and thickness of the palate, pharyngeal depth, presence of adenoids or tonsils, as well as the activity of the pharynx. With this investigation, the results from other examinations are combined and decisions of the surgical treatment is made. Lateral or propyl cephalograms of cleft patients to follow facial growth, which have taught us how to avoid maxillary retrusion by delayed surgery of the hard palate. This long-term follow-up is mandatory in our field of surgery of the growing child. And these are the scheduled radiographs of a unilateral cleft a patient will go through in our center. Many of these measurements are recorded for our national cleft registry. The cone beam CT is sometimes used, not always, for bone graft surgery evaluation and of course has a higher uh, dose of radiation. Complex reconstructions of part of the craniofacial skeleton that we earlier may have struggled with calvalier bone graft with unpredictable long-term resorption can now, through CT examinations, give us patient-specific implants of exactly the missing bone. Radiology has helped us in the investigation, diagnostics, and treatment of complex vascular malformations. Here an example of a venous malformation in the skull base where it shows the intraosseous distribution and an MR angio, its vascular supply. And finally an ultrasound color doppler is uh, uh, for a safe and proper biopsy. When we as surgeons have difficulties with perioperative bleeding, in cases like the neurofibromatosis on your left or the vascular malformations in the center, one way to make the surgery safer with less bleeding is preoperative embolization of the vascular supply. Sometimes the interventional radiology can even eradicate the need of surgery altogether, like the uh, intraorbital lymphatic malformation on your right. A few words about the future. As a surgeon, it would be beneficiary to get machine-trained diagnostic suggestions since we often examine the CT ourselves with limited time available. It would be great if the answers we get would have the same structure for us to read them easily. And we need more measurements and more data for clinical follow-up and research. In addition, we hope to get a better description of the normal population at the different ages, so we can have a better control group for comparisons. Even a radiologist uh, will benefit from artificial intelligence because they see now hundreds of thousands of MRI and CT slices each month and the numbers are raising. With so much information, I think it will be mandatory um, to have machine learning to present an examination with a diagnostic proposal to the radiologist, who then can make the final conclusion. There are new techniques being introduced, like photon counting CT and spectral CT, that will give us more precise imaging and quantification of tissues and thereby we could enhance our surgical results. If we knew, for example, how much fat is missing in a hemifacial microsomia, we could also learn more from biomarkers, think about if we could see the distribution of fibroblast growth factor receptors in the tissue, and maybe even treat them. Finally, there are videos with 4D techniques 
that are under development that would be great for real-time video visualization of vascular circulation in malformations and vascular tumors. Thank you very much for your attention with a tribute to these pioneers of radiology.